Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar. Today we're going to be talking about RootsFinder's family search integration. This is what I'm planning to cover. We'll do a little overview of family search, including how to get an account. We'll talk about trees versus records and where to find person ID numbers. Then we'll talk about importing a tree from family search into RootsFinder and how to get additional generations after that initial import. Then we'll talk about matching individuals to family search when you didn't import your tree from family search to begin with. For, um, for example, if you uploaded a GEDCOM or if you typed uh, everything in manually, then we'll talk about how to compare the information between RootsFinder and Family Search, copying facts and sources between RootsFinder and Family Search, and family members. Then we'll talk a little bit about uh, a couple other Family Search features. So let's get started with Family Search accounts. In order to use the RootsFinder Family Search integration features, you'll need a Family Search account. They're free whether you're a member of the LDS Church or not. If you don't have a Family Search account yet, you can get one at familysearch.org. Click Free Account and it will walk you through their setup process. If you're a member of the LDS Church, it may ask you for your member ID number. You can get that from your recommend or ask your clerk for it. You may also want to find out about additional partnerships for logins that might be available to you as part of your Family Search account, since the church has arranged for special access to some partnerships for LDS church members. So then when you've set up your Family Search username and password, you'll be able to use those at RootsFinder to keep things synced. Okay, so then next, I want to point out the difference between types of family search data that RootsFinder works with right now, so that you understand the types of information that you'll be dealing with. So you have records, which are collections of documents and databases that are collected from various sources around the world. These are not in any sort of family tree structure. At the time of this webinar, there are over 2,000 collections online at Family Search containing over 4.7 billion index names. So that's a lot of, of records there. You have literally things from A to Z with collections like Alabama births and christenings down to Zimbabwe death notices. These records sometimes come from microfilm and you can sometimes get an image of the actual document right here on the site. And it's all free and integrated with your RootsFinder database. And so this is where some of RootsFinder's record hints come from, these family search records. And then the next type of data is trees. We have the family search tree, which is a community tree contributed by family search account holders. And this is a person page, how it looks in the family search trees. Up here, by the name, everyone has an ID number that might be important for you. You can use this number to import someone's tree to RootsFinder with them as the root. And then when you import it to RootsFinder, all this associated information is going to come with it. All these um, photos and all of the sources that are, are here attached to this person. You'll basically get a photocopy of this information as it was at the time you imported it. And then in the future, you can compare your copy with the latest version to see what changes may have been made on either side. So that's a little bit about Family Search. So let's talk more about the integration with RootsFinder. When you first join RootsFinder, you're asked if you want to start to start a tree. And one of the options is if you want to import from Family Search. But that's not the only time you can import. If you want to bring in a Family Search tree later, you can start a new tree by clicking the tree name at the top of the left hand menu, then clicking new tree at the bottom of the box that comes up. Then it will walk you through the steps to start a new tree and you'll give it a name. You'll set the privacy settings and now you'll set the preferences for your hints or leads. So, so then here you'll need your family search login so that it can identify you um, in your place in family search if you have a tree there. And then you begin your tree import. You'll set the start person and the number of generations to import. By default, the start person is you but you can put in that family search ID number that we just talked about if you want this tree, this tree to start with someone else. We recommend you start with four generations back and one generation down for your import because you're going to have to wait while it imports and that could be a while if you have a lot of sources and media. You can add more generations back and down after it's already imported. So we recommend you just start with four and one. 
in the interest of time for this webinar, I'm going to delete this tree and switch over to one I've already imported. So to delete, I'm going to go down here to click settings and then I'm scrolling down to the bottom to the danger zone. I click delete and acknowledge that I can't get it back. Okay, so here I am on a tree I've already imported from Family Search. One thing I'll point out quickly is this little switcher icon. Sometimes people have multiple parents, and sometimes this is legitimate. People have biological and adoptive parents, but more often it's garbage and it can cause problems. For example, here both my mom and my dad have multiple parents that were imported from Family Search. Neither my mom nor my dad were adopted. They only had one set of parents their entire lives. But I have a switcher here for them because Family Search has multiple sets of parents for each of them. If I click this switcher icon here, I can see who those were. I see here that I have a choice between Robert Smith Henderson and Anna Helen Hill, and Robert Smith Henderson and an unknown spouse. I've chosen my view here to show him with my grandmother, Anna Helen Hill, and I could switch that. But actually, this is just garbage, and I don't want this other option in my tree. So I'm going to go over here to Robert's person page. I'm going to scroll down. And I'm going to click edit here in the spouses and children area. I see my dad under an empty shell here. So I'm just going to unlink this from him. And now that weird extra spouse thing is gone. Sometimes junk like that just happens. And I don't entirely know why. You'll just find stuff like that randomly in family search. And we just have to kind of work around it. So that's what you would do if you find something empty like that. Just go ahead and unlink them. And then that, that empty one should go away. And alternatively, if you have an extra in there, you can just delete the extras. OK, so now back on my tree view here, all these stars mean sources have been attached. So I can see at a glance who's been researched pretty well. And these little circles here are leads. That's possible new sources from Roots Finder partners that I should check into. So let's extend my tree down here. I see Anton Levi Peterson is the last generation on my tree. When I imported this tree, I just imported the four generations. So parents, grandparents, great grandparents, and great great grandparents. Now I'm ready to get more out of Family Search. So to do that, I'm going to go to his person page. And I'm going to go to the family search icon here and I'm going to download more generations. Then I say how many generations I'm willing to wait for back and down and then I click import. In the interest of time I'm not actually going to do the import right now but if I wanted to that's where I would do it. So this is a tree that I had imported from Family Search to begin with. Everyone is already matched to Family Search. That's where I got all the information in this tree to begin with. So Roots Finder already knows exactly which person profile in the Family Search trees I want to work with. So now let's switch over to another tree that I uploaded by Jedcom so I can show you how that would work if you didn't import your tree from Family Search to begin with. Now in this tree, Roots Finder doesn't automatically know which person in Family Search I want to work with. So we need to match them before we just start grabbing stuff that may or may not be what we really wanted. I'm going to go over here to this guy, Andrew Peter Olson. He was a character. I'm super interested to see what people have contributed to Family Search about him. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to match him to the right person in Family Search. If I hover over this icon here, it tells me he's not linked yet. So I'm going to click that, then I'm going to review the suggestions for this person in Family Search Trees. This first one looks like my guy, so I'm going to click this circle here beside him to see more information. And now I see more information about this person from Family Search, including his family members. And this helps me make sure that I've really selected the correct person that I want to match. There's another possibility down here. But based on the information I've reviewed, I'm confident that the first one was the right selection. If none of them matched, I could select None Match here, and Roots Finder would add a new person to Family Search for me using my Roots Finder information. But since I'm confident that the first Andrew Peter is the correct one, I'm going to select him as the match. So now the system is matching my Roots Finder person to the Family Search person I selected. So now, See up here, the family search icon has changed. These two arrows pointing away from each other means it wants me to take a look at this and see what the differences are. So I click this 
and then I click review changes and that's going to take me to the comparison page. Here on the comparison page I have my roots finder guy on the left and the family search profile I've matched him to on the right. Now I can just go down this list and see what's different and send stuff back and forth between roots finder and family search. Here I have a burial fact at Family Search that I didn't have at Roots Finder. To bring that into Roots Finder, all I'm going to do is click this little left arrow and then select Add Fact to Roots Finder, and then it gets added to my Roots Finder person. Similarly, if I wanted to add this 1834 residence fact to Family Search, I would click the right arrow and then click Add Fact to Family Search. Family Search always wants you to add a reason why you feel this information is correct. So I'm just going to write because I have reviewed this record and this is the correct family. I'm not actually going to send it to Family Search right now because I'm just demonstrating this. So I'm going to close this instead of clicking save. But that's what you would do. Continuing on down the list here, I come across something else that I want to add. This death certificate here. I'm always interested in those. So I'm going to click to add this to Roots Finder and this time I see two options. Up above I had just a simple burial fact. It didn't come from any family search collection and it wasn't tied to any other database. So all I could do is just copy that over. Now here I actually have two options. I could simply copy it over as it is without further review. Or, because I see that this is from the database Utah Death Certificates 1904 to 1964, I could add it using the Roots Finder Web Clipper. So, let me show you the difference. If I click Add using Roots Finder Web Clipper, it's going to open the Utah Death Certificates database for me right to this exact record. So then I can review it and see what additional information might be contained there. I see it even comes with an image. Great! I love that. I love to get digital copies of records whenever possible so I can examine them and pull out all the information according to my thoughts and preferences whenever I want to refer back to it. So that's actually the first thing I'm going to do. I'm going to open this image and take a look at it. And then I'm going to download and save it to my computer. And now I'm going to come back here to the details page and I'm going to use Roots Finder Web Clipper to gather all the evidence here. I'm going to move this clipper out of the way over here and the first thing I'm going to do is add the digital image that I just downloaded because the clipper doesn't have permission to grab digital images automatically. That's just something that you as an account holder need to do yourself right now. One cool thing I can do here is I can crop out all this extra black space up here if I want to. I just grab the little corner up here, drag it down, and get rid of some of that empty black space. Now, as a genealogist, I'm actually generally opposed to removing anything from a document, even digitally, because I might need that frame number, 1379, and the image number up there. So I'm not actually advocating that you crop. but the reality is you're probably going to want to, so I'm going to risk the wrath of digital preservationists and point out that you can crop by dragging these corners. Okay, now scrolling down, I see that the clipper has copied in the abstracted information for me at the bottom. Cool. So I click Next and give this uh, a title that I'm going to recognize. This is optional. I could just keep going and not worry about it, but giving it a little title here while I'm here just makes it easier to deal with this source later. This title is just for my purposes, so I'm going to name it Andrew Peter Olson Death Certificate because that makes sense to me quickly when I'm looking at a list of a thousand or more sources. So now I just tag it. I click People, and then I tag Andrew Peter Olson, his father Erla Johansson, and his mother, Anna Marie Iverson, who is in my database as Anna Marie Ivers' daughter. Now here on Andrew's spouse, we have Martha K. Johnson. I'm going to type her name, and I don't have a Martha Johnson. I'm going to try it a couple ways just to be sure, but nope, I don't have her. So I'm going to type her name the way I want it in my database and click New. Then I click Next check the summary information to see if I want to update my Roots Finder page headers, 
Nope, I don't. And then I click save. Now, instead of just copying this death certificate over to my timeline from Family Search, I've tagged Andrew's parents and added a new spouse. So now, returning to the Roots Finder screen, I open this source up and I see the image. I see the source citation. Everything is copied over here. So now continuing to scroll, this is the notes section. I could copy over all these notes, but I'm generally averse to just copying in random family search notes. Typically, I would read them, summarize, and quote them as needed. So I'm just going to keep scrolling. Here I have the media section. Unfortunately, a lot of times photos don't get titles. I'm guilty of this too. I forget or I don't know what to title something. So if a photo doesn't have a title, it just gets called media. So right now, if you don't know what exactly that media is, you can't really see what it is, but usually I don't care. I pretty much want all the media, and then I'll just delete duplicates I may not want. So I just copy those over with the left arrow like this. And now, continuing to scroll down, I came to the parents and siblings section. I can match them all to family search right here, which will speed up the match process somewhat because now they will already be linked to the right people because I did it from the, their children's page. You know, I was on this page and I had the family context already, so I was able to link them more easily. So here I'm going to link Andrew's mother. And in this case, I'm going to start with the family search profile for Anne Marie Ivers' daughter. I'm going to click the left arrow to bring her into Roots Finder by clicking Match or Add to Roots Finder. So now it's going to suggest what it thinks might be good matches for her in my tree. So here I have Anne Marie Ivers' daughter. Reviewing more details, I see that she was born in Rakabu, Euring, Denmark. My location matches, but my date doesn't. So looking at her death date and the rest of the family members, I'm still confident that this is the right match. So again, if I didn't find a good match, I could add someone to my Roots Finder tree by clicking None Match down here. But these do match pretty well. I'm confident that these are the same person. So I'm going to click Select Match, and now that will link her profile to Family Search. You can see the blue bar going back and forth up at the top under the header. That tells you the system is working on something in the background. And just be patient for a second while it does its tasks. Hovering over this link icon shows they've been matched in the two systems. And now I would repeat this with other family members, going through them to see what information Family Search has, which might be different from what I have, comparing the sources, sharing information, and generally staying in sync with Family Search. Okay, so one other thing I want to point out here is the additional Family Search functions at the top of the right hand column. You have details, changes, Merge and Refresh. The Refresh just updates your screen to see if there's any new information while you've had this open. I'll open the other three options to show you what they do. The Details link here takes you directly to the person's page at Family Search, so you can see more information if you want to before copying it into Roots Finder. The Changes link changes, um, takes you to the Change History at Family Search, where you can review all the changes various people have made and try to track things down if needed. And the Merge link begins the Family Search Merge Person process. If you feel there are duplicates in Family Search, this will help you merge them in Family Search. So that's an introduction to the Roots Finder Family Search integration. I hope this webinar has been helpful for you. Um, I hope you can get started syncing and sharing your information back and forth, and that will really help you speed up uh, your Roots Finder research. Again, as always, please let us know if you have any questions. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time.